Yo, what's up guys? It's Accepted. Welcome back to another video. So today we're going to be doing another one of the videos where I actually review one of my own videos or where I review one of my own games rather. The idea for today is that I'm going to be looking at a game I can show you right here. I'm going to be looking at this game, um, which I played last spring against Hookie Hijackers in the Swedish League. Um, pretty much what I'm going to be doing is I'm just going to be watching my own gameplay and criticizing myself pretty much. I've asked for a bit of feedback on the last one and something you guys wanted a bit more was what I actually did well so that you guys can learn from that as well. Um, and then actually like throughout explaining without just flat out repeating myself all the time. Alright, let's get into this. In this video I kind of want to focus a bit more on like wave management in general because I remember this game was a pretty good game in terms of wave management. Alright, so let's get into it. I'm playing Jace here again. Um, kind of sucks that I picked another Jace game, but it's alright. Um, as we're waiting, if you haven't already, please subscribe and like, it helps me out a lot. And I mean, for you guys, it's just a click, and for me, it means a lot. So please, if you do enjoy the video, then please, and if you, not, if you don't enjoy the video, then please tell me down in the comments why you don't enjoy the video so that I can prove it for next time. Alright, let's see here. So we take a trade. Um, I'm still playing the standard setup, or the same setup that I did last time. Let me get my epic pen. Alright, so what we did last time... Is we started Doran's Blade, like we did right here, uh, instead of Longsword, which I already covered last time, so I'm not going to cover it too much again, but in general, it's just better to start Longsword, because you can get better resets off with Serrated Dirk, instead of um, the Doran's Blade with like a Longsword on your first reset, or a tier. Um, it just, in general, gives you more lane power, and you don't really need HP in most matchups. If you're playing against like a kill lane, like a Wukong or something, it's a bit more understandable, but in general, um, long sword with three potions is just better. Also playing with cookies again instead of futures market. Um, and I'm also playing with face rush of course. Obviously I couldn't play first time or first strike rather. Um, because this was on an old patch so not possible. But I could have played conqueror which in general I do believe is a bit stronger. Kind of depends on what team the enemy has but I feel like in general it's better. To, it was better to default into conqueror because you can be more of a lame bully. So instead of crashing the third wave right here, we crashed the fourth wave. So we do we play the first two waves pretty well. So pretty much the idea here is that we wanna let's identify like the waves as A. Or the first wave as A, so A, we slow push and we poke this guy. Alright, this is good. And then on B, what we want to do on B is we want to use slow push, and then if this guy walks up, then we want to poke him down to around this HP, if possible. As we can see here, we could easily get auto attacks in on this guy right now. On wave C, which is going to be the third wave, the cannon wave, we want a hard push, okay? This is in general how it works. Overall, a fourth wave crash, or a, where we crash on wave D, is stronger for our reset most, on most champions. I'm not going to say it always is, because on C we have around 450 gold. 500 depends on how well we last hit it and like if we're playing gangplank or first strike or something like that like some econ shit um so what we can get is on jace we can get a longsword we can get a tier um for example with this start i mean yeah those are pretty much the two good options i guess we could get coal it's not too bad um these are pretty much the good options if we reset on wave D, we can actually, what we can do is we will have around 650 gold-ish. This is pretty much what we will have. So what we do here on wave D is we go for the reset and if we have future market as well with long search start, we can get serrated arc. Um, if we can't get serrated arc because we did this start, we can get, for example, a... Longsword and Boots. Um, now we went for this, so we can get Tear instead. We can get Coal. Uh, we can get a ref refillable potion. There are options. In general, it's stronger for your reset. To reset on wave D instead of wave C. But in this, like on a champion like Jace, where we start Longs or Doors Blade instead of Longsword, I think it's in general better to reset on wave C. And in general also, it's better to, or safer to reset on wave C. Hence why we do it. It still gives us that advantage on one item, which we do want. We spent 450 gold, which the enemy doesn't spend. And as we can see, this guy spent 500 gold. So if we can spend 900 gold, then that's a lot better for us, obviously. These, in general, gives us stronger power spikes. If we can pull it off. 
but C is a lot safer. The reason why C is a lot safer is because we can reliably crash this wave in before this guy hits level 3 for example, so he can't really look for all-ins on us, and then also we can't really get all in by the enemy jungler if he decides to path topside. Um, pretty much in the states where we want to crash wave D instead of wave C is for example if our jungler is pathing topside, um, then it can be kind of alright because it matches up pretty well with the skull crab a lot of the time. Um, it's also fine if we know the enemy jungler is pathing bot side and we just want to get our item, or pretty much if we know the enemy top laner doesn't have any kill pressure. Um, in this instance, I guess it's fine to crash on the fourth wave, wave D. But I probably wouldn't do so here. We kind of slow push this wave. It's alright. At least we don't hard push it. But we get stuck in this awkward space, as you can see. We get stuck here. We're really vulnerable to a jungler coming up here. We're really vulnerable to this guy's level 3. If a jungler would come as well, this Gragas himself doesn't really have that much kill pressure, so it's fine. But in general, if Viego would be pathing topside, maybe he reverse cleared or maybe he started top side with or bot side with fake leash to pathing top side it could be pretty scary for us and when we have this kind of gold it's a pretty bad like risk to take i would argue it doesn't really give us a lot for the risk we're taking we get a tier off this i'm considering a tp here while walking to top lane but gragas actually decides to tp in the end um so pretty much at this point i know that it's my job to carry the game so if we look at what just happened the enemy Viego got a kill, and their Nautilus got a kill, their Syndra got two assists, their Aurelia is big shilling, and their Greg is fucking griefed his CP, right? Um, so pretty much, what I wanted to go through, or one thing which I wanted to go through this game, was I wanted to look at how to actually wave manage with you guys. So here's how it works. So when we crash on wave D, like we did here, we crash on wave D, alright, which means that on E, the minions are gonna be stuck here. So let's draw an E here. That's a shitty E, I know. But pretty much it's gonna start pushing towards us because anytime... This is a central line in the lane, pretty much. Anytime the minions, my minions, over here, are on his side of the lane, which they are, then it's gonna start pushing towards me, okay. Anytime the minions are on this side, push this towards me. Pretty much how it works, as long as he doesn't have, like, exceedingly amount less of minions, or if, like, I have a lot more minions, you get my point. So, what happens when we 4th wave crash here? The reason why it's a, such a strong advantage to 4th wave crash here, or 3 wave crash is even better, um, is because we can get a free reset off with the wave pushing towards us, and with 450 gold spent, which he doesn't have spent, we can actually pressure him into having a freeze over here. Or pretty much over here. Because it's always going to start pushing towards us. And it's going to start building up a wave here. Which we can hold with our gold advantage. Which means that we can either force a TP. Or we force the enemy jungler to come top lane. Break the freeze. In this case, he already burned TP. So this option is out. He's pretty much going to get frozen on. As long as his jungler doesn't come top lane. And if his jungler comes top lane. Then if I have a stronger 2v2, we can just 2v2 them. So when he TPs like this and doesn't get anything from it, it means he's griefing his lane. He can't use this when his wave is still pushing like this because it will give me too much of an advantage. He's relying on his team carrying him now while I know that, it, as I said, I know it's my job to carry. So what I do when I come back here, as we can see. What I do when I come back here is I start thinning the wave a little bit. I don't kill any of the minions because I don't want them to die because it's going to slow down the push. Pretty much, the melees, the melee creeps, are the tankers, okay? They are the, they are the ones tanking the wave, while the casters are the ones pushing the wave. These deal damage. We don't want these to die. We preferably want both cannons to die because cannons are RNG. We, we can't really control waves if cannons are alive. But because if cannon decides to focus the wrong minion or gets focused by the wrong minion, it starts pushing in a weird way. We can't really control it. So if we can't get cannons off the boards, we want to do that. Often it's pretty hard to do that because there's no way we really can. Like, we can kill the enemy minion, but we can't kill ours. Um, so pretty much, we don't want these to die. Unless we want to slow down the push. If we want to slow down the push, we kill these. Hence why I try to get these slow. So these guys are tanking up. While I'm trying to get these slow, because if I need to slow down the push, all I need to do is auto once. 
and then I slow down the push immediately. I don't need to sit there pushing or like auto-attacking for my life when Gragas comes back to lane in order to keep the freeze. So I start thinning it a little bit. I don't kill the minions flat out. I just get them a bit lower and then I start last hitting. So as we can see here already, I have 4 melee creeps and 3 range creeps. My Lee has 4 melee creeps and around 6 range creeps. These 6 range creeps are around in the middle of the lane right now, or pretty much they're in the middle of the lane, which means because he has more minions, it's gonna start pushing towards me, and it's gonna start building up this wave even more. And now preferably what we want when it starts getting on my side, like between the middle of the lane and like my tower, between those two, so around this point, we want him to have around 4 casters more than we. So pretty much if we can keep these alive all the time, then that's preferred and we can thin these out. But what we don't want is our melee creeps to crash into these guys, because if they do, they're gonna start killing them really easily because, yeah, that's just how it works, because we have nothing to tank for the pushing creeps, if that makes sense. It's kinda like, if a tank gets onto an ADC, the ADC is gonna die, because it's just how it works, right? Alright, so Gragas comes back to lane, now I've done a pretty poor job here, because now all of the sudden what he has is 6 range creeps and 2 melee creeps. He has 6 and 2, well I have 3 range creeps, which he can kill really easily, which means I need to start thinning this really fast. Otherwise I'm not going to be able to hold this or I'm going to take a lot of damage in trying. So I don't do too bad of a job here in thinning it, but now I actually thin it a bit too much. Because I thin the melee creeps, as we can see here. We don't flat out thin the wave too much. But in order to thin it, we can't just walk up like this and start hitting these creeps or these creeps. Because he will just go on us, right? And we're also going to start tanking a lot of minions. So what we needed to do is get these a little bit lower, around this HP, so that we just need to Q them, or we just need to auto them twice, and then they die. Because then we can slow down the push. Now what we had to do to slow down the push is we needed to kite backwards, we kite, we auto attack, we kite, we auto attack. And in order to auto attack anything, we had to auto attack the melee creeps, which ends up with the melee creeps dying, and this wave crashes into the range creeps. Now when they crash into the range creeps, these are gonna die before the next wave comes. So it's gonna actually start pushing towards him now. This is not the biggest of deals though, because we're still a lot stronger than this guy. So what we can do is we can just build up this wave in order to crash. So let's identify this wave as wave A again. Alright, so we what we want to do on wave A is we want to punish him whenever he tries to go for CS. When he walks up, we go for an auto attack. And we just want to last hit. On wave B, we pretty much want to do the same, but we also want to gain bush control here. And make sure that we don't get ganked. So we can be a bit more careful if he walk starts walking up on wave B. Then we can be a bit more careful, because if he trades heavily on us on wave B, while we can't really die to a gank, we will die on a gank on wave C if we do get ganked. If we're low HP. So we don't want to take a lot of HP on wave B, because that's catastrophic. Alright, so wave C... We can either, we can kind of depend, it kind of depends on the situation, we can greed this wave and slow push it as well, or we can just hard push it right here, or we can hard push wave D. It kind of depends on the situation and the gold we have and where the enemy jungler is. If we are in a threat of getting ganked, like pretty much immediately, or we need to get out of lane, we hard push wave C always, okay? Because when we're, wave C is always going to be around here. Wave C is always going to be around here. So pretty much what happens is that if... We decide to slow push that wave, and we get ganked, we die. So pretty much, if we know we can't get ganked, or we know we can't get all in by this guy, because he's pretty weak right now, then it's fine to slow push wave C and greed that wave as well, otherwise we want to hard push it, and whenever the wave is on his side, pushing towards him, we need to hard push if we're in the threat of dying. We need to get out of the lane. And if we can't hard push her by ourselves, we need someone else to help us, either the mid laner, the support, or the jungler, I don't care which one, but we need someone to help us, and if no one can help us, we're fucked up. Anyways, the point was that it's not the end of the deal. Let's say we crash on wave C. It means we're gonna reset, and we're gonna reset with around, let's say, 1500 gold. It's pretty accurate, I would say. So what we get at that point uh, would be a straight Dirk. So we get a Dirk. And we get a Longsword. And then we go back to lane, and we start building the shit out of this guy, because the wave is once again gonna be around here. 
And then once again his jungler is gonna go ahead back to help him and repeat, repeat, repeat. So whenever we have wave control, we don't have to permanently freeze. When we want to reset, we can actually break the freeze and start pushing towards him. Because it doesn't do us anything to like... It doesn't do us anything negative to break the freeze. Because we can always regain it. Because we have the wave control. And we can always manipulate the wave into our favor. So don't feel the need to break the freeze in a situation like this where we are a lot stronger. As we can see, I have so much gold compared to this guy right now. I have pretty much double this gold. So if we get this wave into tower and we both reset, then I'm gonna, always going to be in a favorable position. Now, if we're not in a favorable position and we're freezing here and we're in a like we're threatening the enemy laner gank, then it's okay to hold the freeze in order to gain a lead where we then can get the control and push whenever we want. As we can see, we start slow pushing. The Gragas is actually like slowing down my push, which doesn't make a lot of sense. And we do start. Punishing him. I don't think he ever dies here. No, he doesn't die, but we do get the wave in, and he's kind of low HP, so I do decide to stay. I would always reset here and if I was playing this game today, I think. Like, it's kind of appetizing to stay, because Viego is reset, but look at the amount of gold we have. Gragas, the thing is... The thing is here... Let me replay. So when we look at Gragas HP, we see that Viego is bought, Gragas is half HP. This is so good for us. But, let's say we reset here. We get us to rate the Dirk, okay? We get the Dirk. Dirk. We get the Longsword like we talked about. We come back to lane. This guy's half HP, he has no TP, and the only sustain he has is his natural sustain, but we're gonna be so much stronger than him, we're gonna have so much more gold spent. When we come back to lane, it doesn't matter, even if he was full HP, we're gonna shit on this guy. But he's not gonna be on full HP, he's gonna be like, let's say 70%. Like around 70%. If he's 70%, we're still gonna shit on him, because we're so much stronger than him. We don't need to stay here, because he's just greedy, it ruins our tempo so much. Now what's gonna happen is... We lose this really good reset we had here. This was a perfect time to reset. This was the wave C, like this wave C crash we talked about into reset. Now what's gonna happen is Viego is gonna reset. He's gonna start walking topside. And what's gonna happen when a six O Viego starts walking topside, or even even worse, the enemy bot lane is gonna re it like swap here or something because it's seven minutes into the game and they're really far ahead. So we lose this like really good reset we have here. Now what we do end up doing is just flat out pushing this wave, which is also fine and it's probably what you need to do in this situation. But with that being said, we would have had so much better of a lead right here if we could just freeze already over here. This guy couldn't play the game. Like I'm not wave management yet yeah, super poorly here, but it could be so much better. This Gragas shouldn't be allowed to play. As we can see, they do swap here. So because we didn't take this reset, we're now stuck in lane and we're gonna lose resources because we decided to be greedy and not reset. Pretty much a lesson here, when we have a good tempo reset, take the tempo reset, okay? Pretty much what tempo means is that we're one step ahead of the enemy. It's pretty much what it means. It's like we can, for example, if we have tempo on Drake, we can move to Drake first. If we have tempo in lane, it means we're gonna be able to get back to lane first and we're gonna start being able to do stuff with our gold first. It means we can do stuff before the enemy can do stuff. That's what tempo means pretty much. So whenever we have tempo, we use the tempo, we use the tempo, and we actually go for the tempo. So for example, resetting instead of taking this plate would have been a tempo play. We would have gained tempo because we would have gotten a free reset and a free recall which the Gragas wouldn't have gotten. Now if we get that free recall, what pretty much is going to happen is we're going to go back to lane. And we're gonna start being able to pressure this guy really hard because we have a huge lead because of this. So because of this tempo, we're gonna be able to get gold later. So tempo now means gold later, and gold now pretty much means less gold later, if that makes sense. So because we decided to stay for this plate, we're losing our tempo, the enemy gains tempo, they push in, and what happens is we lose this wave. So we lose the gold because we decided to not have tempo. So even though it felt really good at first, it doesn't feel that good afterwards. Like, sure, we have TP now when we burn it, and it's kind of alright, but it's super greedy, you know. We could have gained this gold anyways, really easily. Alright, so pretty much, what 160 gold that we get from the plate is, is one cannon wave. Because around, I would say around 15 minions is, 
around 300 gold. And then with a cannon, it's around 160, 180. So pretty much this gold that we gained here, if we had reset, spent our gold and walked back, we could have denied this guy, let's say, three waves at least. Because of his freezing on him while being so much stronger. So if we deny him three waves, that's going to be around 300 gold, let's say. To like 400. This is so much stronger than gaining the 160 gold. And this 160 gold, it doesn't go anywhere compared to the minions. It's still going to be there so we can take it later. So pretty much the lesson is always take the tempo before the gold. If like you have the option. Like obviously there are some times where it's not worth taking the tempo. But as a general rule, tempo now means gold later. So I'm not sure what we really do here. We have this like really strong Jace who is shitting on this Gragas, right? And it's not to like be cocky or anything. I'm, I'm shitting on this guy right now. This is how it works, right? Um, because he TP bot when he shouldn't have. It's not really me doing anything correctly because we, as I've pointed out, there's a lot of things which I'm doing correctly, but also a lot of things which I'm doing wrong. When we look at this game, we can see a very strong enemy bot lane. And we can see a very strong enemy mid lane and jungle. But their top lane is really weak. So when they swap like this, so their bot lane goes top and vice versa. They swap and then all of a sudden I'm in a losing position against their Syndra. Their Gragas, which has been weak all game, is now facing a weak Samira Galio. So sure they get to free farm, but all of a sudden I don't really get to play the game. Also, one thing to notice is that what happened here is Viego went cleared, he went bot, he reset, he went top for Herald, right? With his enemy if with the enemy bot lane. So what happens is these camps are gonna start respawning. While Hecarim cleared all of these camps recently. So what means is that Gragas, even if he can't see us under tower, he can go back into his own jungle and farm Gromp, he can farm wolves. Viego doesn't care. Because Viego gets hurled, Viego gets scuttle, Viego can even take, like, I don't know, he can even take waves top if he really needs it. And what happens with me is that I'm just crying because there's no camps for me to take, so I'm getting starved. While Gragas, while he's also getting starved, he's not getting starved as fast as I am. It's kind of like, if you look at it in a war perspective, because I've studied a lot of history in the past, um, so pretty much what you would a lot of the times do is starve out your enemy. And even if you're starving, it doesn't matter if the enemy starves faster, right? Like, if you, the enemy's dead, it doesn't matter. So pretty much, if I'm starving faster than this Gragas, then the Gragas is pretty happy, I think. Especially considering that I'm pretty much, at this point, this Jace is, as I said, what's gonna carry the game. Let's be honest, like, with how it's going for the team right now, they're probably not gonna be carry this game, because they've invested, the enemy team has invested a lot of resources into the bot side of the map. So the top side of our map has to carry. This is how it works. And I'm not say as I said, I'm not saying that to be cocky. Like, if I was the ADC this game, I would still feel like, alright, it's not my job here. Like, it's my job to starve less than the enemy top laner and be more useful than them later on in the game, if that makes sense. Once again, what we see here... Once again, what we see here is I take, like, the... I remove the temple play. But take the gold instead. This time it's a bit more fine because the enemy did an awkward swap. So I don't really lose a lot of tempo from this. This is the, kind of what I was talking about. Gaining the plates. Like later on into the game. Which I always was going to be able to get anyways. Um, like the plates aren't going anywhere. And this was pretty much a prime time to take it. I think I might have overextended it a little bit. Um, trying to take two instead of one. I think I should just have taken one and taken the wave. And then go, gone for a reset. Because now I'm going to lose the wave here. Unless I stay like this. Which, I mean, to be fair, I can because this Gragas has no kill pressure on me, but... At the same time... Let's say I can gain 200 gold every minute in League of Legends. That means my opponent can also gain 200 gold every minute of League of Legends, flat out from minions. Um, now, if I were to reset... when I After I kill this wave, even though I don't get the 160 gold plate... It means that I'm gonna be able to come back and I'm gonna be able to deny at least two of these. So two times... 200 is 400, right? Which is greater, 400 or 160? I think it's pretty obvious, right? Now, obviously, one wave is not 200 gold. It kind of, like, there's more than one wave every minute. Like, there's, like, 
1.2 or something. And then there's also passive gold, which accounts into it. But at the same time, we could starve the enemy top laner a lot more with the temple plays instead of just greeting for gold. It doesn't really matter how far we accelerate if we're really far ahead. Like, at some point, we actually gotta make sure the enemy doesn't get ahead as well. It's kind of like playing... If you're playing chess, or not playing chess, that's a bad example. Um, but if you're in the late game, or in the mid game, rather, and you have a 200 gold shutdown, right? And the enemy doesn't have a shutdown and you trade one for one, obviously you're gonna lose 200 gold to the enemy team. But obviously, that flat out is bad. But at the same time, if you... Let's say none of you have shutdowns, and you're just ahead by 2,000 gold. Um, like... Losing that gold and neutralizing it, like, let's say we're, we're at 10k, our team, and the enemy team is at 8k. And then both teams just die. No shutdowns given or anything, both teams just get aced randomly. Um, obviously, it's an unrealistic example, but it's a pretty extreme example, that's why I'm talking about it. So, what it's gonna do is, it's gonna push us towards this maximum limit, let's say, of infinite. It's gonna push both teams towards this goal. When we reach this goal of infinite, it doesn't matter if we have 200 gold more plus infinite. It doesn't fucking matter. Like, no one gives a shit. Like, we're already at the late game stage, right? We don't care about trading at a certain point, right? Because we want to pretty much go to like two or three items while the enemy is stuck at like one to two items, right? If we both get to like 6 items, or if we get to 6 and they get to 5, then it's still pretty bad for us, right? Like it's not as good as this difference, definitely not. It's not as good as dif this difference, because this is still all playable, this is not too bad. This is manageable because of how much, like, for every item you get, like let's say you could get 100 items, at that point you wouldn't even care about the next item you would get, because it's just like... It's kind of like getting a level up, or not even a level up, but getting like an adaptive damage rune, right? It doesn't really matter, like it matters a little bit, but you can still outplay without it. So you want to keep this, if you have a lead, you kind of want to start denying your opponent more than like accelerating yourself, if that makes sense. Like if you are at one item, and the enemy has no items, you're gonna crush them, everyone knows that. Like, this is how it works. But I can't tell you all in all honesty that I have been at 4 items and always beat someone at 3 items. But I can tell you honestly that I've every time I've been at 1 item against an opponent at 0 items, I've always beat them. This is how it works. So this 1 item lead which we have, we want to keep it at, like as slow as possible pretty much. We don't want to accelerate the enemy team at the same speed as we accelerate ourselves. Because it's going to mean this difference feels a lot less than it does on 1 item. I explained this pretty well in my Nidalee guide, like in the late game stage, because pretty much Nidalee curves faster than enemy champions, and you kind of need to start denying your opponents really fast instead of accelerating yourself because of how poorly you scale compared to other champions. Um, but in general, the like the general rule is that if you're ahead, don't just play to get yourself even more ahead. Just play to keep the opponents behind in a way. It's just gonna make the games a lot easier, I think. Like if you're both full build, it doesn't matter if you're ten thousand gold ahead. That's the easiest way to example it. Obviously, you don't always get the full build, but that's kind of how it feels. Like, you should have that kind of way of thinking in your head. Like, let's say you're pretty much your strongest at three items. Then we can see you're full build at three items. If they're, they're at three items then later on as well, then, and you're at four items, then it's going to feel a lot worse than being you on three items and then on two items. Alright, let's keep going with this game. Um, I'm playing really passive this game. Um... In general, because I'm not really getting a lot of attention, I think we communicated this as well though. I'm warding a lot the defensive wish behind me to not get doved, which I do make a good job of not dying when they swapped and everything. Pretty much when you get swapped on as a top laner and you have to keep playing weak side, your main goal, your main goal, I'm telling you this right now, is to not die. I don't care if you lose 5 waves, if the enemy top laner dies and you don't, you've won. Like, that's what separates the really good players from the average players. The ability to not die when you, like, are in the threat of dying. Like, just having the respect to your opponents and saying you're not an idiot. And that, you know, they can play as well. And that you should just respect them. And instead of just, like, giving them more resources, just don't take the resources at all. 
as we were talking, the Night Dam, like, sometimes it's worth suiciding for a wave. Um, but in general, if you don't die and you lose two waves for it, then that's that's so good. Especially if you can go and take Gromp or Wolves or, like, take a camp in the meantime or gank mid or whatever. Like, if you can go do something productive in the meantime, then it's so much better than dying for a wave. And trust me, like, the best feeling for me as a top laner when getting weak sided on is that if the enemy top laner dies on weak side, while I'm also on weak side, like we swapped, I feel so good. It's the best feeling in the world. And we're talking about a comeback here now because we're actually starting to get into the game. I'm starting to get strong on my two items. So now what my goal should be, I don't think I focus on this in this game, but what my goal should be is to deny this Gragas of resources rather than trying to accelerate myself. Maybe pushing myself towards free items and then starting to do that is also fine because their bot lane is pretty strong or the rest of the map in their team is pretty strong in general. But after free items, like for me when playing Jace, these two items is what makes you. Eclipse and then Mana Mune and then Cyrilda if you can get it is so good. But after that I'm always like, what do I build now? It kind of depends on the game. Sometimes I build Edge of Night, sometimes I build Jumus. Um, it really depends. But I never feel like that fourth item spikes me. Like when I get to Cyrilda, like when I get to third item, I will literally tell my team, always on Jace, I'm really strong now, I can literally 1v9. But when I get to 4th item, I don't even mention it, because it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel like there's a difference between these two. And it's, as I said before, like, the, like, the difference between 3 and 2 items is so much bigger than the difference between 4 and 3 items. And the difference between 1 and 2 items is also a lot bigger than, like, 3 and 2 items, and so on. Okay, so... Okay, so we could see there, at least. He he's not even on one item. He's not even on one item and we're on two items. If we just start denying this guy, like, do you ever think he's gonna be able to trade on us with one item compared to our two items? No, of course not. We're in such a good position. Alright, so we take a bad kind of trade in mid lane. Um, maybe a bit over aggressive and then see it properly. And now we just try to keep the wave, pretty much. Or we try to keep the enemy team from taking the tower. I can't really see how top lane is pushing. I really wish I would pad my camera over there to make a decision. But just judging from the minions, it looks like it's pushing towards them. But I'm not entirely sure. Like, if it's pushing towards me, then I'm really happy to do this trade. If it's pushing towards them, I'm kind of unhappy. Because it's like, they're going to be able to catch the wave afterwards. After the slow pushing wave. While if it, like, I'm not going to be able to do that if it's pushing towards them, right? Alright, so I actually kind of feel good about it, my team's position here. I mean, I feel like I could do so much in this game. Like, there's no one that could contest me. And even if they send two people, like, there's a good chance that he's one with two. But this is the strength about greeting as well. But we could also, like, I feel like we could just have been so far ahead. Like, right now, when I look at this game, I feel like I am ahead. I don't feel like my team is that far ahead. I feel like my team could have been far ahead if we played towards denying the enemy team more than just accelerating ourselves. But to be fair, Hecarim is doing quite well, as we could see there. He's actually on two items, uh, like two and a half items even, which is the same or even a bit more than the enemy Viego. He's also two levels ahead. He's doing pretty well um, for the rough early game that he had. And I'm also starting to look for Jesus on side lane because I know that if they misstep, uh, I'm going to start to look here. Here's the actually deciding team fight, I'm pretty sure, in the game. What we do here is we go on Gragas, we one-shot him. So my flash here is really bad. I remember this really well. I'm gonna slow this down so we can look at this because this is pretty much a deciding fight. So we kill the Gragas and I'm like, all right, I wanna go on Syndra right now. So if I just flash like this and then Q on her like this when it comes up. So I flash this guy's E, he can't one-shot me and then we kill this guy because we pretty much one-shot him. It's really good for us, and then I can even use my E to get the uh, Aureli away from me. Now instead I'm gonna have to flash onto this guy, like I did here. And I'm still gonna have Aureli Q on me because I got hit by the E. So I feel like I could have survived there. We didn't play it super poorly, but I feel like we don't have to die there. It's kind of unnecessary. Um, but we're really strong at this point. Um, I think we go Nash from the looks of it. That was a pretty quick and decisive team fight. It's kind of like for me in that fight, like when you're playing as a carry top lane, like if you're playing as ADC and you're the fed guy, your pretty much main goal is to try and DPS as much while staying alive. It's pretty much a goal. If you die as ADC, then it's pretty bad for you. 
Like, I remember Double Lift especially saying once that just don't die. That's like your main goal. Um, as top laner, I feel like it's kind of similar. Like, I don't want. Like, it kind of depends on which champion I'm playing. If I'm playing a champion like Jace, um, definitely what I want to do this game is I just want to play cleanup because I can one shot pretty much your entire backline. So if they're frontline, these two guys commit like they did, I'm just gonna be able to kill everyone, which we did here as well. Um, if we had flash better, right here, I think we just don't die as well, and we just kill everyone. We end up killing everyone as well, but like either way, but we could have done it without dying. I remember the fight, this fight really well. Nautilus went in on me really unnecessarily and we just end up killing him. Like, And I think this was pretty much the game. We end up sieging them down pretty slowly. I play poke with my team pretty much. But I don't think I get any more kill participation. Like, I don't think I get any more KP this game if I remember correctly. Even though I were a part of some of the fights. Which is a bit awkward. Like we look at here. I zoned the Aurelia. And then this guy, like, I got none of the assists or anything. Uh, but I feel like we played decently well this game, and I feel like we did a lot. Like, the one time we had to do a lot was when we were on three items in mid lane, and at that point we did a lot as well. And it really felt like we did our job, at least, of getting ahead of this Gragas and, like, really being a strong, like, strong this game, because later on into the game, we saw that no one could really deal with us. Alright, not bad, not bad, not a bad game. Um, I hope you guys learned something from this game. Um, let me pop over here. My shitty camera. Alright, uh, I hope you guys learned something from this game. I tried to focus a bit more on wave managements and kind of recalls. Because waves ma wave managements and recalls kind of go aligned with jungle pathing as well. Um, those three all go aligned pretty well. Like, you want to wave manage depending on your goal, your recall timers, and jungle pathing. It's a bit advanced, but the first step is understanding how waves work, which I think I explained pretty well, and then also how to like manipulate the waves. Um, and then we can start talking about how you want to manipulate the games in which like circumstances, which I did a little bit as well. Um, but in general, that's pretty advanced. So maybe I will do a video later on on that if you guys want to see one. Um, anyways, guys, that's gonna be it for me. I hope you all enjoyed. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for more.